Next, on AM 1480 WLEA, the Newsmaker Show. Here's Ryan O'Neill. Wednesday, December 11, 2019, another Wadi Wednesday. Glad to have with us Alfred State History Professor, Dr. Nick Wadi. Thank you for coming in. Oh, it was an honor, Brian. Thanks for having me. Um, what, uh, you like to, uh, post, uh, publication, uh, you like to post articles in some pretty good-sized publications. Anything recent? Uh, I recently, uh, published something in Town Hall about the British election, um, and about Trump's masterful handling of the, uh, NATO summit, where he directed his fire at, uh, Macron and Trudeau, as you might recall, and avoided complicating matters for Boris Johnson, who seems poised to win the British election. And then I go on to analyze that. And uh, my my notion is basically that this is a huge opportunity for Britain and the United States, um, and that uh, Trump could benefit from Boris Johnson's victory. I'd like to get some uh, audio sound bites. Can we go to those? Absolutely. All righty. This is... Uh... This is from the Sean Hannity Show. Sean Hannity giving his thoughts on the uh, Inspector General's report, which, as I said to Dr. Gary Ostrauer, it seems to me that when um, I.G. Horowitz wrote this thing, he was trying to, to some degree, give both sides something so they could claim victory. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and I think at the end of the day, he's an employee of the Justice Department. And so he's he, got to watch it. He has a record of, um, to some degree, uh, covering up for for the uh, misdeeds of the Justice Department. So I think what we got out of him was, was more or less what we expected. There are some interesting... Well, let's go to the Sean Hannity clip about the uh, IG's report this week. Based on the evidence collected to date... And while our investigation is ongoing, last month we advised the inspector general we don't agree with some of their conclusions as to the predication of how the FBI's case was opened. In other words, we've got evidence to the contrary. Let's be let's let's be blunt here. That's what he's saying. And it's also uh, a preview, if you will, of coming attractions. He's, he's pretty much saying, stay tuned. We have a lot more. Now, remember, inspector general referred Comey already prior to this release today over leaking memos and and lack of candor and Horowitz found the FBI's handling of the Clinton emails remember senior bureau officials showed a quote willingness to take official action to prevent Trump from becoming president he's already said all of that Dr. Nick Waddy yeah what Sean Hannity is referring to there is uh, John Durham's reaction uh, and his uh, official statement about the IG's report. And I think that is the most, that is the biggest piece of news here because um, what John Durham is saying is that he is pointedly disagreeing with the inspector general about, on the issue of predication. Basically what he's saying there is that he feels that uh, this might have been a setup and that, that the people who pursue this investigation against the Trump campaign may have had malicious or illegal motives and, and may have broken the law. So what that what that says to me is that um, the IG's report is, is far from being the last word on this issue, and John Durham may believe uh, that he has a criminal case against people in the Obama administration. That's going to be huge in 2020. Okay, John Durham, uh, his title's what, a federal prosecutor? He's a U.S. attorney, federal prosecutor, that's right. Okay, um, John Batchelor on the John Batchelor Show talked about that, too. I wanted to play that clip really quick. Mr. Durham says, I have the utmost respect for the mission of the Office of Inspector General and the comprehensive work that went into the report prepared by Mr. Harwitz and his staff. However, comma, our investigation is not limited to developing information from within component parts of the Justice Department. Our investigation has included developing information from other persons and entities, both in the U.S. and outside of the U.S. Based on the evidence collected to date, comma, and while our investigation is ongoing, comma, last month we advised the Inspector General that we do not agree with some of the report's conclusions as to predication and how the FBI case was opened. End quote. From a man, I'm told, who never comments during an investigation. 
Dr. Waddy. Yeah, <clears throat> I totally agree. This is this is big because Barr didn't have to make a statement. John Durham didn't have to make a, a statement, but they went out of their way to say to basically fire a warning shot across the bow of of the Obama administration, the FBI, the CIA, who knows who else, uh, that uh, this this is not over. Um, now, how far they can take it, I've always believed that at the end of the day, the media and the Democratic Party are going to dismiss the idea that anything wrong was done in, in the investigation of the Trump campaign. And they're, they're not even going to talk about that issue unless um, big fish in the Obama administration get indicted, uh, and potentially convicted of crimes. That's that's the only thing that's going to get the left's attention and get them to take seriously that there was actual wrongdoing against Donald Trump, because otherwise they just don't care. Talking to uh, Alfred State History Professor Dr. Nick Waddy, uh, would you like to hear a little what uh, Tucker Carlson says about uh, Carter Page in this whole thing? Absolutely. Steele's so-called dossier was absurd, and that was obvious from day one. No legitimate news outlet would run it. It was so clearly false that even the reckless Washington Post kept a distance. It was left to BuzzFeed to print it, a cat blog. And yet the Obama administration used the same document, the one that no one would print because it was so obviously false, they used that as a pretext to spy on the Trump campaign. The dossier claimed that Trump aide Carter Page had been promised a 19% stake in a Russian energy company, a bribe worth $10 billion. And keep in mind, when you're lying, the more specific the lie is, the more likely it is to be believed. So the lie in the dossier was he was offered 19%, not 18, not 20, 19% interest in this energy company if he could persuade Donald Trump to lift sanctions against Moscow. Now, the claim was wrong. It was made up. It was false. It was a lie. Dr. Nick Wadi. Yeah, well, we certainly know that almost everything in the Steele dossier was complete nonsense, and but it was readily believed by many people in the Obama administration, the Department of Justice, the FBI. So the question is, are they are they were they duped? Uh, are they really that dumb? Uh, you know, will they accept uh, even the thinnest uh, of evidence uh, as proof that Donald Trump has has done something wrong? Are they are they naive, in other words, or um, did they know that this case was incredibly weak, but did they pursue it for political reasons? It's, it's hard for uh, those of us on the right to believe that anyone could take seriously the idea that Carter Page is a Russian spy or Donald Trump has some, some secret agreement with the Russians. And given the fact that there's no uh, direct evidence to support any of these accusations, why would it have gone as far as it went? And I think the only conceivable answer uh, from where I'm standing, is because they desperately wanted it to be true. And even if it was false, they didn't care because it was useful. You know, there's been a soundbite uh, that uh, has been going around on the uh, news talk shows. And uh, I wasn't clear when I heard it if it was uh, Attorney General uh, William Barr or uh, John Durham. But it was about the Trump uh, joke about, hey, Russia, can you find Hillary's emails? And uh, that was a very interesting statement. It, 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 uh, I, Sean Hannity's played it, and others have too. And I, again, I don't know who's on the soundbite, but basically what they say is Trump uh, was not privy to the details of the Hillary email investigation he would have known, as everybody did through the media, that uh, Hillary had like 30,000 missing emails. But uh, he would not have known at that point that uh, there was any kind of inquiry into Russian involvement with that. And it's impossible, basically what the, whoever it was, or Barr, Durham said, what the, the feds were really exaggerating that. And it was uh, it was just impossible that Trump could have known that. Well, uh, as I understand it, Hillary Clinton's emails were obliterated along with her server, uh, you know, intentionally by her uh, to avoid complying with, I think, a congressional subpoena, which you could call an obstruction of justice. But of course, that's never the case when a Democrat is involved. But I think the more important point is Donald Trump during the election campaign made a joke 
as Donald Trump often does. He said sarcastically, Russia, Russia, please find Hillary Clinton's emails. We all want to read them. And that was a joke. Um, and he wasn't seriously inviting the Russian security services to invade anyone's privacy. He wasn't advocating the the uh, breaking of any law. He was making a joke. And people on the left make similar jokes all the time. Uh, and, you know, uh, for some reason, everyone on the left is incapable of of comprehending the fact that Donald Trump has a sense of humor and not everything that comes out of his mouth is meant to be taken literally. Uh, so I certainly don't think that was a criminal act and I don't think Donald Trump ever invited foreign interference in the 2016 election or in the 2020 election. Continuing with what um, Tucker Carlson said, continuing with that soundbite now. Page actually was a former naval officer, an Annapolis grad, and had done nothing wrong. And yet the FBI targeted him anyway. Prominent figures on the left accused him of betraying his country. Carter Page's life was destroyed. Worst of all, and this is what we learned today, the FBI knew exactly what was happening, and they kept doing it. The FISA warrant against Page, the one that allowed the Obama administration to spy on him, had to be renewed multiple times. And according to the IG report, the FBI repeatedly lied and excluded exculpatory information in order to keep that FISA warrant alive. Dr. Nick Waddy. Now, this is really scary stuff, Brian. I mean, uh, if if you can create a pretext to spy on Carter Page and through Carter Page, the Trump campaign, then you can pretty easily create a pretext uh, vaguely within the law to spy on, on any political campaign. Uh, all American political campaigns, certainly at the federal level, have connections, sometimes tenuous connections, sometimes very close connections to foreign governments. If it's not the Russians, it's the Chinese or the British or the Australians or the South Africans or the Brazilians. These, uh, every campaign is, is um, shot through with these connections. You can, if you're inclined to be a conspiracy theorist, you can blow any of these connections out of proportion and suggest that someone may be compromised by foreign influences and thus initiate an investigation. And I think what the IG is saying is that maybe technically everything the FBI did was within the law, but it was certainly not ethical, it was certainly not reasonable, and the standard of evidence that was used against someone like Carter Page uh, is a joke. And, and I think even the FBI director agrees that their procedures need to change so that something like this never happens again. Yeah, there's been a lot of complaints about the politicization of uh, intelligence agencies. We have Dr. Nick Waddy with us. I want to play a little audio from the Brian Kilmeade show. This clip from the Brian Kilmeade show starts out with uh, uh, California Congressman Adam Schiff. The president's misconduct is as simple and as terrible as this. President Trump solicited a foreign nation, Ukraine, to publicly announce investigations into his opponent and a baseless conspiracy theory promoted by Russia to help his reelection campaign. President not, Trump uh, not true. Uh, and that was Adam Schiff. We're going to get Nancy Pelosi in a second. My bad. Uh, obstruction of Congress and abuse of power, the two articles. Not only is Nancy Pelosi not going to get any Republicans, she's not going to get all Democrats. She already lost two going into this. I don't know how many more she's going to lose. This helps her in the Midwestern states. This impeachment doesn't. Dr. Wadi. Yeah, that is that is the critical question at this stage. How many Democrats can um, Nancy Pelosi and Adam Schiff and Jerry Nadler bring along with them in this in this uh, this joke of an impeachment? Um, uh, the articles of impeachment don't surprise me greatly because they've been talking about abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. Note that both of these articles of impeachment are made up. They've never existed before. They're not crimes in any statute book. Uh, they're an attempt to spin uh, their interpretation of, of Trump's actions in a way that could justify uh, an article of impeachment. But every single swing state Democrat in the House of Representatives is going to have to think very carefully about whether they want to vote for these articles because, um, you know, the evidence is thin, I think, to support uh, the abuse of power, all the, all the central allegations about, about Ukraine. 
Uh, obstruction of Congress could very easily be resolved through the courts. If you, if Congress desperately wants a certain document, they can try to get the courts to, to order the Trump administration to give them that document. They didn't. They don't feel like it. They'd rather impeach him. Well, look. Um, they tried for about three years to impeach and remove this president based on Russia. And these articles of impeachment make it clear that they're completely giving up on Russia. Uh, they've dropped that. They've embraced this setup on Ukraine. And they're hoping that sheer enthusiasm carries them over the finish line and they can get these vulnerable Democrats to vote for these two articles, or at least one of these articles. And I think it's it's an open question whether they really can. Um, it'll be down to the wire. Talking to uh, Alfred State History Professor Dr. Nick Wadi. Uh, before we go to the break, I wanted to uh, play a clip of uh, Rush Limbaugh. And what he says here, Nick, is uh, what a lot of conservatives have been saying, that uh, there's a pattern here of accusing the president of uh, what some in the— uh, upper uh, Demo- upper level Democrat uh, party are guilty of. Schiff is the guy spying on people, not Trump. Schiff and the Democrats. Biden is the guy that engaged in bribery and extortion with Ukraine, not Trump. Dr. Wadi. Well, I think in many cases the Democrats are guilty of precisely what they are accusing Trump of. For one thing, they're guilty of inviting foreign interference in the 2016 election and the 2018 election. And now the 2020 election, the Obama administration worked with intelligence agencies all over the world to try to gather dirt on Donald Trump. Um, And for some reason, that doesn't bother the Democrats in the least. The Chinese interfered in our 2018 election by uh, directing their tariffs to punish Trump constituencies and Trump voters. Uh, And um, that didn't bother the Democrats in the least. Um, So I think they are often guilty of what they accuse Trump of. And um, uh, unfortunately, the media is not going to take that that notion seriously. And as I said, the only thing that can sort of redress that balance and, and get the left's attention, I think, at the end of the day, will be indictments and criminal convictions. And whether John Durham can, uh, can make any of that happen, we'll just have to wait and see. All right, we're going to take a, a quick break. And uh, when we come back, we'll talk about uh, this day in history with Alfred State. History professor Dr. Nick Waddy, stay with us. Yo classified. This coming Sunday morning, there'll be two Oikany pancake breakfasts in the area. The South Dansville Fire Department has an Oikany pancake breakfast serving 8 to 11 a.m. at the South Dansville Fire Hall. $7 for adults, $6.50 for seniors, and $3 for children. All are welcome. Oikany pancake breakfast this coming Sunday morning at the South Dansville Fire Hall. And there'll also be an Oikany Pancake Breakfast this coming Sunday morning at the Canisteo Rod and Gun Club. $7 for adults, half price for kids, serving 7 to 11 a.m. this coming Sunday morning. An Oikany Pancake Breakfast at the Canisteo Rod and Gun Club on Baker's Gulch Road. And again, all are welcome. To get in on the radio classifieds, call 324-1480. Checking in now with meteorologist Rob Carroll. And hey, Rob, a little uh, snow out there this morning. Yeah, we've had a little bit of snow, Brian. A band coming off of Lake Erie impacted the area. That's uh, now lifting northward. Uh, the band is actually uh, passing north of the thruway to the north side of uh, Buffalo, up towards North Tonawanda and Rochester. Uh, but it may waver back uh, later today. We'll go back and forth between clouds, a few breaks of sun, a gusty breeze, and a couple of flurries and snow showers. We're 30 to 35 today. Brian's sun came up this morning at 7.30. It sets tonight at 4.38. We'll have clearing skies tonight. Lows are going to drop down to about uh, 10 to 15. Now, tomorrow we're into the influences of high pressure, and that's going to result in partial sunshine. We should be around 35 tomorrow afternoon. Partly cloudy and breezy weather, the story for tomorrow night, 25. We've got a storm system headed our way on Friday night. Clouds will be with us Friday. We're 45. And, Brian, much of that storm looks like it's going to be in the form of rain for Friday night and on into Saturday. Back with Alfred State History Professor Dr. Nick Waddy. Uh, Dr. Waddy, this day in history, and a lot of people know this, I'm guessing, from uh, different TV shows that they've watched or movies about uh, December 11th, 1936, Edward VIII steps down from the throne in England. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, Brian, I think uh, the popular understanding of, of that momentous development is that uh, he uh, fell in love with an American woman uh, who was twice divorced or would soon be twice divorced. Um, her name was Simpson. And um, uh, he wanted to marry her as king. Uh, he was willing to make it a morganatic marriage so that she would not actually be queen, but uh, basically, the powers that be, the Church of England, uh, the establishment, could not accept uh, um, not uh, an American wife might have been problematic, but a, a divorced woman as as the uh, wife of the king was extra problematic. So he was pressured to abdicate, and he did abdicate, and that had some major historical ramifications because it meant his brother became king, King George the Sixth, and he was king during World War Two. Yeah, what's that great movie about the speaking coach? The King's Speech. Uh, was, did you see that? Yeah, sure. Wasn't that great? It was a great, uh, a great movie, and it is amazing. Really humanized. You know, yeah. I, I, there's a lot of soap opera type things where they're very critical of uh, Diana and Charles and stuff. This really humanized uh, that family. Yeah, and, and there's some great irony in the fact that uh, the abdication of Edward VIII resulted in his brother becoming king and then his brother's eldest daughter, Elizabeth, becoming the queen because temperamentally George VI and Elizabeth II probably aren't well suited to being monarchs. Um, but Edward VIII uh, was much more outgoing and much more enthusiastic about being king and seems to have regretted for the rest of his life after his abdication that he was no longer king. Uh, and, you know, history really could have been different had Edward VIII been king, because uh, one thing we know is that he was less inclined to confront uh, Nazi Germany. Um, he, uh, I think many people believe that he would have been less likely to appoint uh, Winston Churchill as prime minister in 1940. Winston Churchill was a very influential figure in w world history and in the history of the Second World War, as everyone knows. So I think, um, you know, everything changed because of the abdication of, of Edward VIII. And um, uh, so uh, it is it is a, a really important uh, anniversary to mark. This day in history, and this would be December 11th, 1941, Hitler declares war on the U.S. Germany was in an alliance of sorts with Japan and was obligated to uh, fight with Japan if Japan was attacked. But Japan wasn't attacked. Japan was the aggressor. So uh, Germany was not obligated by treaty to declare war in the United States. And technically, hostilities did not yet exist between Germany and the United States. But, um, you know, and this was one of uh, Hitler's biggest blunders, clearly. Uh, he felt that, that war with the United States was inevitable, that FDR wanted war with Germany, and he certainly did, and maybe FDR would have arranged it anyway. But, um, you know, uh, Hitler had the option of not declaring war, uh, and he chose to go ahead and do it. And what's interesting is um, uh, December 11th comes a few days after the beginning of the Russian counteroffensive around Moscow, which really uh, stopped the Germans in their tracks and made the Germans uh, start to question whether they would be victorious on the Eastern Front. But that probably hadn't sunk in yet by December 11th. If uh, the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor even a week later, uh, the, the calculus in Hitler's head um, might have been rather different. And he might have hesitated to declare war in the United States. And um, even if, if war between the U.S. and Nazi Germany had been delayed, not necessarily avoided, but delayed, that could have affected the outcome of uh, World War II on the Eastern Front. So, you know, this timing is everything. And uh, Hitler was clearly wrong to declare war in the United States. And, um, and the rest is history. We've been talking to uh, Alfred State history professor, Dr. Nick Waddy. Dr. Waddy, I want to thank you so much for coming in. Oh, it was a lot of fun, Brian. I look forward to doing it again.